Hello, good afternoon, everybody. We are here for a mini conference with a few of our members of European Parliament, our fellow pirate colleagues are, that are in Brussels working hard for us, or may, maybe they're working from home uh, today. It's undisclosed, we're privacy minded. So, with us uh, right now, uh, we have two of our European Parliament members. We have uh, Marcel Kolaya. Do I say it correctly, Marcel? You say it absolutely perfectly. <laughs> and, um, and as a public figure, uh, I, I am really fine with disclosing where I am. I am in my office in Brussels. <laughs> and Pat Patrick Breyer is also here, uh, the German MEP for the Pirate Party, Piratenpartei. How are you, Patrick? Hi, thanks for inviting me. I'm and also happy to disclose that I'm working in home office today, so from Germany. Good. So uh, we we worked uh, already with you for the European elections to, two years ago. Would you like to tell the the Dutch public a little bit about uh, our cooperation, uh, please? Uh, yes, sure. So maybe <clears throat> I'll start. Um, you know, then uh, maybe pa Patrick um, uh, may have some other. Uh, items to add, but what I would like to stress that uh, that the European pirates are really a, a European movement. Actually, the pirates are a worldwide movement. We have a pirate party also in Australia and other continents. Um, uh, when it comes to <clears throat> the European part of our movement, uh, we have a European uh, pirate party. Uh, where the individual political uh, uh, parties, individual pirate parties in, in individual member states are a, a member. And um, we use that uh, European political party as, um, uh, as an umbrella organization where we also discuss, you know, our, our very, uh, you know, uh, a common approach to policy making so that we are uh, aligned on what we pursue and um, before uh, the elections in uh, 2019 we we held several sessions with pirates across Europe of course including the Dutch pirates where we put our uh, common program together and we uh, actually ran with a, a common uh, Euro European uh, program uh, in the elections, so 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 all pirate parties in the union ran with the same program, um, and uh, and you know I would also like to use this opportunity to uh, to thank my uh, Dutch colleagues in their participation in in drafting that program because it was it was a very important exercise and it was also really important to know that everybody is on the board so that, so that we know that we are pursuing pursuing the same policies across Europe. Yes, thank you very much. I was uh, personally involved in that uh, working group. So <laughs> thank, you, thank you for the compliment. So uh, these days, uh, a very big part of our laws are actually derived from European, what you call it, Richtlijnen. Uh, so, uh, guidelines. Guidelines. Thank you. So, uh, official that, is directed. Hello, by the way. I'm sorry for welcome. coming Welcome. And mentioning the European Pirate Party, um, the um, the chairman of the uh, uh, European Pirate Party has just joined because Mikulaj, uh, the colleague of Patrick, and 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 I in the European Parliament. Um, is a chairman of the European Pirate Party. Yes, and so because many of the laws that we are uh, faced with today that are being implemented in the Netherlands 
actually derived from European guidelines. Uh, yeah, uh, so uh, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of like working on the economic policies. Uh, however, uh, this one is the, let's say, the anti-corruption issue. Uh, as you probably know, uh, the European Union has certain powers. I mean, like uh, the European Union uh, has generally like a, a tight cooperation on, let's say, uh, internal security and justice. And uh, that's why it is kind of like trying to tackle also the, the financial criminality, frauds and uh, stuff like that. Uh, in general, if, if I should summarize it, it is very much like fragmented. I mean, there are European European guidelines to uh, theoretically tackle the, the, the financial crime. Uh, however, in, in practice, uh, mostly all the national, national authorities are kind of like able to, to do stuff. And should you be uh, should you be willing to uh, kind of like trace the trace the crimes uh, uh, cross border, it is very much uh, uh, being being complicated due to various obstacles like the databases are fragmented, uh, incomplete. Uh, they are using different uh, different uh, type of. Uh, data uh, like it's not really like compatible uh, between between various countries so what we are basically trying to do is sort of like establish let's say common standards that would uh, actually uh, simplify the, the effort to really doing uh, do it automatically because so far uh, really like the, the anti corruption fight uh, quite often and this uh, ends in the situation that we are able to, to chase just uh, one problematic uh, problematic case while there is a, a full uh, or a heap of a heap of others that are not really uh, being uh, being accessible that's why we have started to to work with this uh, with this question of uh, agricultural subsidies uh, it somehow touches very much the Czech prime minister who is uh, uh, so far, the, let's say, the richest agriculture uh, agriculture tycoon in, in Czech Republic. But uh, as said, like, uh, besides of owning uh, a big agricultural business, he also uh, like runs the country and hence the, uh, the, the direct influence on the common agriculture policy or let's say the agricultural subsidies being paid to him. So this, this type of uh, this type of activity shall be like disclosed and shall be prevented because basically like when you are uh, are uh, getting money from from the public uh, administration you should definitely you should definitely not influence that I mean like it should be it should be independently decided uh, we face similar problems like in Czechia we face also in Poland Hungary Romania Bulgaria like generally the eastern states have quite like complicated structure of uh, complicated they have specific structure of uh, agri agricultural ownership and that uh, very much uh, that very much um, uh, kind of like uh, creates creates this type of uh, corruption I mean, uh, probably it's not uh, that's not that much interesting f from the Dutch perspective. Uh, however, uh, one important part uh, occurred, which I think or I believe uh, would be like reasonable to to understand also for Dutch pirates. I mean, usually pirates have no uh, let's say agricultural policy at all. I mean, for us uh, in Czechia, what uh, happened and what would become let's say uh, mandatory that we have. Uh, become a party with a strong agricultural policy, with a strong focus on, let's say, small farmers and family farms to support them against these uh, big agricultural tycoons. I believe, like, generally the, the uh, pirate policies shall be and are in general uh, oriented towards support of small and medium enterprises. So when we come to this question of uh, fighting corruption in, in agricultural business, I think uh, it is kind of like natural to, to prolong it and apply it uh, apply it for for the sector of industry as well. But I, I think uh, I've probably diverged to uh, quite uh, far from my for, from the original question, so I will probably pass to the to the other colleagues. Yes, because there's also limited time that uh, people are available. Let's uh, let's move to uh, Marcel. Mar Marcel, you 
you have uh, artificial intelligence as as your specialty as also our top candidate our number one on our list uh, Matthijs Pontier he's also an academic AI researcher specifically into the ethical aspects of the <clears throat> of AI because AI uh, can be very useful but it can also be abused can you tell us something about that how AI is a very good reason why to vote pirate uh, this season yeah absolutely um <clears throat> Uh, I'll try to squeeze it in in a couple of minutes because that's definitely a topic that uh, can um, that for 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 which we can take like two hours and and speak because um, artificial intelligence um, is uh, you know a, a a technology emerging technology let's say um, that uh, becomes part of our daily lives because. When we speak about artificial intelligence, that can be anything from self-driving cars, which is something that we will most probably see in the very near future very often. Um, uh, it can be a system that uh, screens your CV if you apply uh, to a job. And it can be a, a search engine on the internet if you want to see something so it can be like really anything it has applications in healthcare transportation everywhere um <clears throat> i um this is one of the areas that i focus on because um especially for the reason that uh that it is part of our daily lives it, it affects us a lot so um uh, my my portfolio in the parliament, if you will, the areas that I focus on are mostly digital topics. Uh, so there is a chunk of it that relates to um, internet regulation, like the Digital Services Act. Uh, there is um, a chunk that relates to the internet, but also more broadly to uh, regulate uh, so-called gatekeepers or big tech, if you if you want, like the Digital Markets Act, and there is this chunk of artificial intelligence, which includes technologies of, of various uh, applications. Now, um, as you can imagine, it, it's a it's a big difference uh, if you know the technology that we speak about is um, a screening uh, pictures in 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 hospital. To see to, to look for patterns uh, for for cancer, so that it can you know help um, uh, the, the doctors to uh, to detect uh, a, a disease, for instance. There is a difference between that and between some uh, very you know minor uh, use of AI that does not really affect uh, our life and death uh, so so in that sense um, the the commission's plan you know to to, to regulate that space which now uh, at this moment is to a huge extent unregulated even though that it uh, affects our daily lives already and it, it and it will evol evolve and it will it will you know broaden uh, to to the extent to which it affects our lives um, the Commission plans to approach it uh, by assessing the risk in different, you know, applications um, uh, uh, to to high risk and low risk, and and that's the start where uh, where we would like to see a bit different approach from the Commission. But we have also other uh, issues that 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 we want to address. So. Um, so uh, I fully agree, the pirates fully agree that we need a, a regulation uh, for artificial intelligence. And now it is the time uh, to, to legislate that regulation. And uh, from my perspective and from the perspective of the pirates, we need a, a lot more categories than just low risk and high risk, because um, as you can imagine, the, 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 the risk level 
it can be very very different and it's uh, it's absolutely not fair to say that technologies uh, that uh, are gateways to information on the internet uh, that basically affect what information you can see for instance are not in a uh, some a tangible risk category and is only low risk and uh, and and everybody who works with that technology uh, like the companies uh, that operate on the internet they don't have to adhere to any kind of rules and they just uh, it's just guidelines for them so so we we believe that it needs a, a lot more risk categories and and then um according to that there should be a strict regulation um uh, so and the reason why we uh, are doing this is that these days even though many of you don't know many of us don't know we are not aware we are subject to artificial intelligence um it as, as i said it can be anything starting from chatbots on uh, on uh, on web pages or even on the phone and um uh we believe that uh, people have the right to know that they are subject to artificial intelligence. Their fundamental rights should be kept, uh, even though when uh, even when they are interacting with artificial intelligence, and that machines uh, that are you know fed with data. Because when we speak about artificial intelligence, we very often also speak about machine learning. So we have an algorithm that is learned uh, that is taught basically by uh, by some data set that uh, uh, we believe that uh, when we are subject to that there there always needs to be a an element of human decision an element of human oversight imagine systems and 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 these are really emerging imagine systems that they would decide on on border control, whether you go from se for s secondary screening, imagine how that system uh, that is uh, biased with the current data would, for instance, um, send people uh, with a different skin color to the secondary screening much more often uh, than people with a uh, white uh, color skin. Um, uh, imagine systems uh, using in uh, judicial authorities where they would, based on some data, uh, decide on a parole or even, uh, you know, decide on whether uh, people are gu guilty or not. And we cannot just let this beast off the leash. We need very strict rules. We need to create these boundaries. And, and within these rules, uh, then we need to give the companies the space where they can operate, where they can innovate, so that we use the artificial intelligence as a human-centered technology, that we use it for our benefit of our society, and not in order to keep huge companies, for instance, in control. Um, it, it, uh, governments uh, uh, with authoritarian regimes, for instance, in control, like it happens in China with facial um, um, recognition and detection with a so some kind of a social score, etc. So the possibilities with artificial intelligence are endless, and we definitely need uh, regulation, and we need people who are knowledgeable in that area, like these academics and researchers who actually know what to legislate, uh, because this part of Legislation is not a piece of cake. That, that that's a very uh, not only important but also very technically difficult uh, type of legislation that needs knowledgeable people. Yes, for many of the example, the things you mentioned, like oh, we have to think about that. Uh, we pirates know several examples, like in the in the U.S. There really has been these. Uh, artificial intelligence is uh, sentencing people with darker skin color longer, even when it's not really explicitly inserted. 
and many other examples. And so uh, this directive is coming from Europe. And then it's really important that people like our our Spitzenkandidat uh, Matthijs becomes a legislator in the Netherlands to to implement that. Am I right? Well, that's that's at least what I hope for. Um, uh, I believe that it should be a regulation on the directive in the end, but that doesn't really matter. Um, uh, in 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 this you know sense, we definitely need knowledgeable people who would be able uh, 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 to to co-legislate in that field. Um, and you know, just to stress, you know, a couple of uh, points. I mean, uh, on 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 the policies, I believe. And the pirates, you know, pursue this idea that, for instance, facial recognition that I spoke about uh, in relation to China in the public in in public spaces uh, sh should not be allowed because that's a mass surveillance. Um, and the pirates um, have been from the very beginning very much focused on uh, privacy, how to tackle privacy concerns, um, uh, how to deal with issues that that could. Um, uh, be very invasive uh, to people's privacy, and um, and this technology can be very easily misused, very easily abused, and we, as I said, we already see it in China. So so it's not a uh, it's not a science fiction. It is happening, and we need to prevent that uh, from happening in Europe. Uh, as much as you know, algorithms on the internet when it comes to uh, when it comes to uh, let's say your social media feed, as an example, you should be able to understand why there are uh, posts that you are seeing and why, it, uh, why there are posts that you are not seeing. If you open your social media feed, you typically don't see everything that you are subscribed to, but they are somehow prioritized. So these algorithms just decide on our behalf uh, what we want to see, and we definitely need more transparency uh, on uh, on that process. So these are all these issues that we will need to tackle so that, as I said, we have a technology that is human-centered and works for the society and not, not for huge corporations to uh, be in power or in control of the market, uh, not for authoritarian governments that uh that uh, that you know use the technology in order to be to be in power yes thank you very much uh, marcel then now uh, well, i want to turn to what i for me feels as the most scary stuff the stuff that patrick uh, is working on like uh, we often make the joke that authoritarian authoritarian regimes say how how do you want this law packaged terrorism or think about uh, the children and he's working on uh, both uh, those terrorism regulations that are being abused for far more than just uh, terrorists and chat control which also doesn't feel very good. Patrick, can you tell us something and how how Dutch people can help us protect uh, online safety for real instead of these fake uh, ways? Thank you. Yes, uh, sure. And um, some other justifications they like to use is um, organized crime or the war on drugs um or even uh, piracy um so there is a, a lot of uh, choice on on that and um so these two um eu proposals that you have uh, discussed um are about uh, terrorism and um about um preventing child sexual abuse that's how they are framed and let me explain what they are about so the proposed regulation on the terrorist content online is one where um, we pirates have had um, a major impact and, and that really demonstrates how important it is to have um, pirates at the table when it comes to legislation. Um, the regulation is being proposed um, to prevent the spreading of terrorist content which means which can include terrorist uh, propaganda 
which can include uh, instructions for building weapons, which can include um, streams of live streams of terrorist attacks that they record themselves. Um, it's intended to prevent the spread of that on the internet. And already by that title, you can tell uh, just how far reaching um, the idea is that it was somehow possible to to prevent that information from being spreaded, which it is not, of course. Um, so um, the negotiations on this on this file are concluded, and it's up for to be voted um, in in April, I think. So there is still time to to intervene and contact your members of of the European Parliament, but it's likely that it will get a, a large majority and that um, only our group and um, um, the left probably will vote against it. So what have we achieved? Um, we have, uh, first of all, prevented an obligation on platforms to use uh, error-prone upload filters to um, suppress terrorist content. And the problem with that would have been that no filter can tell whether the photo of a terrorist attack, for example, is being published by a terrorist organization for propaganda purposes or is being published by a media outlet for reporting on the terrorist incident, which is perfectly legitimate. So um, upload filters in this context result in massive overblocking. And it was a major success that, um, in this case, a Parliament uh, refused to, um, to introduce, as proposed by the Commission and as pushed for by member states, uh, mandatory upload filters uh, for terrorist content. We also achieved explicitly protecting journalism, arts, and, and sciences. So there is an exception for legitimate activities in the regulation, which is important because its definition of terrorist content is worryingly wide and vague. And um, the definition of terrorist content is being handled very differently throughout member states. Um, and some, such as Spain, um, artists have been prosecuted um, for using anti-terrorism law um, for songs or um, for parody that they've made. Uh, in France, they've used it on, on social unrest. Um, in Hungary, they've used these laws on immigrants. And so there is a, a huge risk of abuse. We've also managed to introduce an exception from the one hour deadline from removing terrorist content once you uh, are asked to do so by the competent authority. And there's an exception from the one hour for small and non-commercial operators, which is important because at night and uh, during the weekend, it's impossible to make the one hour. And um, if um, high penalties um, were uh, hovering above you or looming, um, some operators uh, could have decided to close down the site entirely. But still, what remains in the package is an unprecedented and ultra-fast cross-border removal orders mechanism without judicial review. So that means that um, every member state can appoint as many authorities as they like to issue removal orders. Uh, and not just relating to content hosted in their own country, but in any anywhere. And this will have to be removed within one hour. And that threatens the freedom of expression and freedom of the press online. Uh, because even uh, people like uh, uh, Viktor Orban and um, his, uh, um, his government will be able to have digital content deleted throughout the EU, which opens the door to politically motivated internet censorship. Um, for example, he could say that <clears throat> a call for protest against his government uh, was terrorism because of some, I don't know, uh, some violence that he thinks might might happen there. So this is very dangerous that we have allowed these cross-border effect to removal orders. And it's also very dangerous that um, there is a lack of judicial review because um, these removal orders can be issued by, by ministers. And um, that, of course, makes them very prone to be used for political purposes. And actually, in France, a very similar legislation, the so-called Avia law, has already been declared uh, unconstitutional um, for the combination of a very short time frame, a lack of judicial um, review, and other elements that are also imminent in this European uh, uh, regulation. And still, they have not 
heated this and they they claim that this is different but it's not really and um, that's why we fiercely um, oppose the regulation even though if we've managed to make it less bad than it could have been but really will this regulation actually prevent terrorism i don't think so uh, you know to to prevent terrorist uh, radicalization and recruitment it, it would take more than removing some stuff from the internet um, it's useful to, to address legitimate grievances such as discrimination against muslims or human rights violations abroad and in wars um, these are actually drivers for recruiting uh, um, uh, terrorists. Uh, it's important to have stable funding for civil society work against hate ideology and Islamism. It's important to have de-radicalization and exit programs. And of course, there needs to be a, a, a vigorous prosecution of um, uh, terrorism and messages inciting it. But funnily enough, um, one thing that the member states opposed in this regulation was to oblige providers to report terrorist content, which is um, criminal, criminal terrorist content um, to the police, because they actually think it's too much work to prosecute terrorist content, which is terrible, because just removing it without any consequences will only result in terrorists circumventing this, maybe moving to other platforms such as, as Telegram, and so it's a completely wrong approach to only um, try to take uh, stuff down. And, and um, yes, it's a whack-a-mole game um, that won't be very effective. Yes, I think I'll, I'll uh, stop on this one and maybe Marcel can explain on the chat controller. I don't want to be speaking too much. <laughs> Well, actually, I, I, I truly apologize. However, my time is up. I need to leave um, for, for another meeting. Um, so I would like to thank for the invitation um, and wish you good luck in the elections. And, and, and hopefully uh, then, um, then we next time we speak, you have a representative in uh, the national parliament. Yes. And I'm really looking forward to the pan-European cooperation on the pirate level. Uh, thank you also on behalf of Matthijs, who is following this uh, uh, via uh, Periscope, uh, but has such a bad uh, 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 internet connection that he didn't dare to join us uh, uh, with that. So uh, I, I uh, say hi from uh, Matthijs, uh, the number one as well. Thanks he for... will be the one that uh, in two weeks, if all goes well, will be our national parliamentarian. Um, so, uh, Mikulas, will, will you stay after Marcel or do you also have to leave? Okay. Because um, I also would like to d discuss the, the corona test evidence, the passport thing. But uh, maybe first a little bit uh, chat control. And thank you very much for your explanation about uh, uh, Patrick. Uh, Matthijs is joining here. And uh, have, a, have a nice day, Marcel. And thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. Bye-bye. So, okay. Mikolas, maybe. Or Patrick or Mikolas, who, which of you is best fit uh, to discuss the chat control, the encryption breaking uh, proposal. If you don't mind, um, Mikolas, I will take it because I'm the group's shadow on the file. Okay. Um, so what are they uh, proposing now? Um, chat control is basically um, the end of the um, digital um, secrecy of correspondence. Um, they want all private messages. It to law enforcement. The majority of these reports are actually false in the sense of they don't con concern criminal material, but it could be a photo of uh, a family at the beach, for example, with, with naked children. That is clearly not, not child pornography. In the majority of cases, innocent people are being reported to the police. According to the Swiss Federal Police, it's even up to 90% of the cases that where innocent uh, uh, people are being reported. And um, if these cases don't get thrown out right at the beginning, it could result in having your, your house searched. 
and maybe um, the neighbors will know about it and even the investigation can have terrible consequences. But there is more to it. 40% um, of these investigations for possession of, of child pornography are actually targeting minors. So this is also about uh, criminali criminalizing uh, young people. And also, the companies are not only looking for known material that they've referenced in the database, which is very um, erroneous, as I said, but they are also using AI um, to look for unknown material. And of course, this so-called artificial intelligence and machine learning comes with a great error rate. And so basically, if, for example, a teenager uh, sends uh, consensually taken photos, uh, so-called sexting, um, these risk ending up in the hands of some Facebook staff somewhere in the world, um, in the hands of organizations um, that uh, um, uh, the purpose of which is child protection, but we don't know who's handling them there, in the hands of police uh, all over the world. And so um, this risks that um, nude photos that are legal um, end up in the wrong hands and people could be blackmailed or they could even create new um, child pornography from it. But, yes, um, in the, in the yeah. Edward Snowden movie, that was also one of the most shocking uh, scenes for me that the, these NSA agents were sharing nude, nude pictures mm -hmm. of innocent people with each other. Like they were sharing nude pictures of guilty people. Uh, no, I'm joking. but. <laughs> Uh, it's also just... happened that it's also happened in the past that a Google um, engineer um, used his systems to approach uh, minors inappropriately. So there have been cases of abuse, and uh, we need to to reckon with that. And um, um, once the system is established, and U.S. Uh, um, corporations such as Google on Gmail, uh, Facebook on on Facebook Messenger. Uh, Microsoft on, on Outlook.com are already using um, this technology, not European companies so far. Um, but uh, once the system is set up, you can, of course, look, use it for all kinds of other purposes, to look for so-called terrorist content, so for political content, to look for uh, copyright uh, violations, uh, or even, as in China, to look for um, criticism of, of the, the country's president. So. Um, this basically sets up a system where private communications that are supposed to be private between two people um, are being screened without any reason, are being generally monitored. And that, of course, has a chilling effect. Some people will no longer want to use um, those channels. Uh, for example, uh, even victims of, of sexual abuse need uh, private communications for seeking help, for seeking advice when they contact lawyers. Um, but also in the telemedicine, you you don't want your um, your pictures to be uh, to be screened and maybe hand up in the hands of, of some random uh, staff abroad. So this has a huge chilling effect, and uh, most of all, it creates a, a really terrible precedent because if it was lawful and it is not, because even the court of, court of justice has decided you cannot do this without um, any any reason and and indiscriminately. But if this was legal, it would basically establish a precedent that it's okay to intrude private spaces just in case uh, and, and on, a, on a blanket basis. So that means um, you could, for example, um, require the manufacturers of smartphones to screen the, the, your device storage or manufacturers of, of laptops to, to screen um, your, your storage. You could even require the post office from opening, scanning all letters to see if there's something illegal in it. Uh, you could search homes at random just because you might find um, uh, some, some criminals. And you would in some cases, by, by chance, of course, you would. But uh, we don't allow for that because um, really in a country where this is permissible, where your, your private spaces can be invaded at any time without any reason, um, this becomes more oppressive than the questionable benefit that they hope for. And to talk about the, the alleged benefit of this uh, procedure, the US corporations do send hundreds and thousands of reports of child sexual abuse material, most of which are false. Um, but 
at the same time, the number of these reports keeps going up. So this is not even resulting in less circulation of this material. And here we're only talking about the open channels like Facebook Messenger, etc. We're not talking about encrypted channels that do not use this um, indiscriminate um, content screening so far. This mass surveillance is not used on encrypted channels so far. But um, the commission first wants to legalize, wants to allow companies to, to use um, this chat control. This is what we're currently negotiating. And later this year, they want to come up with a second proposal that would make it mandatory for all providers, including European uh, providers. And um, Jenny has they, a question, I think. Can I just add one thing? And they are considering in that context to even include encrypted services, such as um, WhatsApp, uh, Signal, uh, Threema, which would break the encryption. OK, and now I'm happy to take the question. OK, uh, well, the random intrusions of uh, private space uh, under the umbrella of terrorism or uh, pornography, child abuse, uh, it's happening everywhere, not only in Europe, but everywhere. And uh, the pirate parties everywhere are, uh, uh, well, opposing fiercely against it. Uh, do you sense some help from other parties? Are there other parties uh, uh, helping you in fighting this uh, uh, terrible thing? Uh, uh, is my question clear? Yes, it is. Well, we've managed to, to convince the group, um, to uh, the, the entire group, in, in which there is um, most of all the Green Party, but also um, other um, regional uh, parties and uh, movements such as uh, Volt and some uh, ecologist partners and some separatist parties, etc. We've convinced them to follow us, even though it is a difficult topic and it's an emotional topic, uh, because emotionally you're prompted to, to do everything if that can even save one child. But rationally, uh, you understand, of course, that there must be limits. Uh, you, you can't allow torture, even if you hope to be saving a child, because this is about humanity and because um, human rights are indispensable and are so important also to children and victims of crime that um, in the end, uh, giving them up and hoping for some benefit um, results in an oppressive regime and, and doesn't help um, children and, uh, and victims either. So what can you do to help here? Um, uh, basically, you can raise awareness because there's hardly any media uh, coverage on this. You can uh, contact uh, your media and ask for them to, to cover it. You can produce own uh, videos. You can also write to um, the members of parliament that are negotiating this. On my homepage, I have a, a letter and I have some graphics and some videos that you can use to, to, to raise awareness about this. That will be very helpful. Well, uh, Wietse, also present in this uh, conference, uh, was very zealous into uh, uh, translating everything uh, Julia Reda, your predecessor, uh, wrote about it. Uh, so, yes, uh, uh, your message is uh, heard, but, well, it, it, it sounds like uh, uh, we, we're the only one uh, calling out in the desert. Uh, that's a, that's Patrick. A, I don't know how it translates. Patrick, the from the examples. The website would be very useful. So if you can make a Dutch translation, that would be great. There is also on, on the um, Mattermost a Team Awesome that we've set up for people who are willing to help us. And it would be great to have you there. Patrick, the examples you gave, they they seem to imply that the these laws are actually also harmful for some of the children. So like the intent of these laws is to protect uh, the children, but if they are harming these children, isn't that a valid consideration also? They are harming them in multiple ways, by, by removing private spaces that children need, um, by criminalizing children, um, by um, risking to, to place um, intimate material of, of children into false hands, into the hands of, of staff, if the algorithm um, reports them. And um, 
Uh, actually, nobody's ever asked children if they want this um, this general monitoring in place, which is supposed to protect them. I think if you ask children, they would want to, to have their privacy as well. And nobody even asked them. It's only the so-called child protection organizations that think they know better than children themselves. Um, but really, this doesn't protect uh, from from child sexual abuse because the offenders will, of course, not use uh, Facebook or, or, or Gmail for, for sharing their material. They use underground channels. They use uh, encrypted channels. And um, even if this uh, general screening drove them away uh, from the major platforms, um, they would be even more difficult to prosecute on the, the dark web and the encrypted channels. So it, it probably even makes uh, prosecuting them more difficult. Yes, thank you very much. Maybe one of the Dutch candidates has a question for the uh, our European Parliament. Not not right now, I see. Okay, uh, maybe you can tell us something about uh, getting elected. Uh, Oh, I see Saira has a question. Saira, can you talk? Yes, I can talk. Uh, well, I have a question. Oh, uh, what you've told us uh, is uh, one of the major problems in the Netherlands regarding child abuse. Uh, in the Netherlands, uh, many children are taken away from home about the things you have told. Um, so, uh, uh, well, up upcoming campaign. Uh, we would like to uh, put some more address about this problem. And maybe you have some advice uh, for us uh, how to deal also with this problem regarding to other political parties in the Netherlands. Yes, um, it's very important to to explain to um, other political parties that even though this is intended um, to protect children, in the end it has um, the, it creates a collateral damage that um, outweighs the benefit that they hope for. For example, last week the German Bar Association has warned that um, victims of abuse would actually be the first to suffer from this because they need um, help and support and advice and um, they need this private channels and they need to be sure that if they discuss abuse cases um, that this is not being uh, reported to to some others because they want to quite often they want to be in control of whether um, the police is involved or not and um, they they need this these um, safe spaces even in the times of pandemic all the more and so it's it's important to explain about this because if you don't, and if the label of of child pornography is enough to justify anything, then um, really our our fundamental rights are at risk. So you need to look deeper than the label on on something to to understand does it really help, or does does it do more harm than than it helps? And I welcome the fact that you are looking into the um, the child trafficking. Uh, which which is um, indeed um, a terrible uh, problem. We've discussed this recently in the European Parliament in um, context of um, of prostitution and sex work and legalization or not. And we pirates have decided to um, to oppose the criminalization of uh, prostitution because we believe that. Um, um, if this is criminal, then you create a, a, an illegal market. And in an illegal market, um, 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 there is more incentive, and it's more likely to use um, forced uh, to use forced labor and um, involuntary uh, um, sex workers than in a legal and regulated market. I hope that that touches a little upon your question, even though I'm not an expert in in, uh, in child trafficking. Yeah, we have uh, also. Uh entire chapter about sex work in our election program. But I would like to return to, to Mikulas. So you you are now the second 
second biggest party in Czechia. Uh, can you tell us something about the position of the pirates inside parliament, the cabinet? How, how are you working there? Yes, uh, I can tell you. I mean, like, uh, the truth is that uh, there was already a poll published where together with our coalition partners, Pirates, uh, were footballing as the strongest party. And it is admitted and it is our clear plan that we want to have the next prime minister of Czechia uh, be Pirate. I mean, since uh, October. So uh, please keep fingers crossed for, for that, uh, should it happen. I'm often being asked by the, by, the, by the other pirate parties, what was the difference? Uh, well, uh, the situation was kind of like specific in the way that Czechia was uh, kind of like uh, messing a lot, of, a lot of issues that are traditionally to be considered pirates. I mean, like the country was not really effective by means of like digitization of public administration. I mean, we are living in 21st century and people are expecting uh, that, for example, tax statement or any any other contact with uh, with the public administration will be delivered online in sort of like a web form. And they, they don't have to go with a paper uh, to do this paperwork uh, directly in the in the uh, local communities or wherever you do that. That was just one of the things that we were lagging. However, there was a lot of issues regarding corruption and uh, lacking of transparency uh, in, in the public sector, because as said previously in, in my previous intervention, uh, the prime minister, he's using the public money in order to enrich himself. And it's, everyone knows that and it, it works that way, like for five years. And no one was so far able to, to do anything about it. The pirates really like came and started digging into the problem and really like uh, taking, let's say, the legal actions and moving that uh, moving the whole issue forward. I mean, we are doing that in the national parliament. We are doing that in the uh, in the European Parliament. We are working on that and moving moving things forward. Because when speaking practically, uh, what the citizens do expect is sort of like delivery. People expect from politicians that they will. Uh, Follow them. They will they will answer their uh, their uh, to their like, let's say requests, but will also provide solutions for the the uh, the things uh, we uh, for for the things that people uh, people need. And I mean, uh, we were successful because the pirate party is quite capable not only to criticize but also to provide a good solution uh, good solutions uh, for for various problems thanks to our let's say shared ideology shared program. And uh, we just we just need to deliver them. That was what we have what we have succeed in. We have uh, succeed in 2017 to to persuade common people that we are not just like a protest party. We are not just like criticizing, but we are really able to provide a real uh, concrete solution for the actual problems that the people are facing in their uh, in their uh, let's say common life. I mean, well, that could, we have yeah. we have very big corruption problems in the Netherlands as well. The party, political party of our prime minister, the VVD, they over the past four years, the past uh, election cycle, they they had more than twenty people criminally convicted, but somehow this prime minister manages to to distance himself from all these convicted criminals. These these criminals, they leave parliament and someone new, clean, will come in. And then, like, it's like in four years, it's like every two, three months, uh, there's a new scandal of a corrupt criminal politician leaving. But it seems like our, our media, our doesn't really care much about it like they announce it and then like a week later there it's forgotten again do you have any tips on how we can get get the corruption moving a little bit well uh, two things first of all speak about it i mean uh, any opportunity to uh, any opportunity to pick it and describe what was wrong and how to improve that would greatly, greatly improve that. Even if you are not unable so far to, let's say, introduce binding laws that would break the break the circle and 
change the situation, still it is definitely a good idea to bring proposals on the table how to do that. When it comes to the proposals, I would say uh, we desperately need much more transparency in the way how our politics work. I mean, we as pirates, we were pioneers uh, who were uh, like as a first party, we have started using transparent accounts. I mean, transparent account, uh, it's something which is most likely available only in Czechia or a few, a few more countries. The idea is that uh, your balance sheet is being published by your bank. So it is not about like you can audit, uh, you can cheat on who is financing your party or uh, what, what happens there. Simply everyone can see on the page of independent authority till every single cent uh, we are spending and we are receiving what we have done. And I mean, uh, this is quite like useful because if you see it in, let's say, machine readable form, you can easily match it towards like uh, here there will be like a, a, a list of payments received by the party from various companies. And then there will be a list of companies receiving public money. If you do it by machine, you clearly see, yeah, there is some some pattern and you clearly identify, well, this part, a particular businessman is kind of like subsidizing the a party in order to win public procurements later on uh, to, to, and, uh, to, to get the money and put them back, back to the party. That's the way how, to, how politics works. And uh, what we do need is to really promote transparency so this problematic uh, connections between politics and business will be uncovered and shown. And I mean, like, of course, your prime minister, if there, there is no transparency, can always claim, hmm, I didn't know about it. Well, there has to be a clear like, way to see what ha what's happening in the, in the party, who is financing that, who is promoting particular interests, so that people can really like see before it actually happens and also see who is responsible in within the party for, for promoting corruption schemes and plots. So that will be my answer. And uh, I know that this is taking quite a lot to uh, time to, to convince people to, to, to really change their minds and to, to work in a different way. But I always uh, was happy that pirates acted as pioneers for really like showing, uh, showing the, let's say, the best practices in, in our parties and really leading by example this, this anti-corruption transparency fight. Okay, well with that we are almost at the end of our uh, hour. I would really like to to thank our MEPs for, for joining our session today. Uh, I would <laughs> like, <laughs> like to thank also Marcel who has already left. Mikolas and Patrick, and I would like to thank all the the candidates that have uh, joined joined here, and think we'll we'll continue like another ten minutes here with uh, with the candidates uh, talking. Um, so thank you very much. Uh,